Hey everyone, just a special intro for an audio v version of the cartoon flashback and I'm going to be talking about a cartoon series that has recently made a comeback as of this Memorial Day weekend and seeing as though it's 11.34 recently started its official run on the Hub channel and that is Gem and the Hologram so stay tuned for that ladies and gentlemen an audio version of the cartoon flashback where I talk about Gem and the Holograms next Stay tuned, you're going to like it. Yes, she is indeed truly outrageous. Welcome to this audio edition, as I mentioned before in the introduction of the cartoon flashback, as we take a look at Jem and the Holograms, or otherwise known as Jem. Now, as many of you probably know by now, if you looked on Wikipedia, you've Googled it, and if you have the channel known as The Hub yourself, then you know that Jem has made a return to television as of this weekend, this past Saturday. With a four-hour sneak peek, if you will. Actually, three-hour sneak peek of the series. And officially made her official debut here on the, on the Hub Station today, Tuesday, May 31st. Where she will be broadcast three times a day, apparently, on the Hub. The same episode three times a day. And... When you take a look at this, it kind of works out in some man in some kind of a manner. You see, those at Hub know that there are many people like myself, my sisters, my cousins, everybody that grew up in the 80s that grew up on shows like Jim, and that many of us right now either have jobs that we have to do during the day, either we got to clean house, pay the bills, pick up the kids, watch the kids. We may not have time to sit down and watch this show. So what does the Hub do? They decide to broadcast it, not once, not twice, but three times. Once is at 11 o'clock Pacific Time. 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific Time. Then at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time. And then at 10 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time. All the same episodes so that if you didn't catch it the first time, you can catch it the, you can catch it the next uh, time it airs. Now, a lot of you may say this is overdoing it with this show like Jim. Well, it's not really overdoing it because, again, like I mentioned, the people at Hasbro realized that people like myself that grew up in the 80s would want to catch an ep episode even if we missed it. Now, depending on if it's on demand, it's a totally different story, but I'm not sure yet. I'm pretty sure it might be. Um, I'm pretty sure it might be. Hold on for a second. Well, I uh, do this. I'm not sure if it'd be on demand now, seeing as though the show officially started today. But, sorry about that. M mouth at the uh, mic. But, uh, yes, she is now on. But basically, overall, what I'm saying is Jim is now back on television. And no, I don't see anything on here that says Gem. All I see is the new Transformers Prime, as well as a um, few other episodes like G.I. Joe Renegade and Fraggle Rock and My Little Pony Friendship and Magic. But still, but still, folks, Gem is now on television once again on the Hub. Like I said, three times a day. Now. The other news for Jim fans out there, or anybody that grew up with this show, either you were a girl, where it was targeted at, or a boy, which at times it did target too, when you look closely at it, 
Gem is going to be re-released onto DVD later this year, apparently. Last word I got back in, this, back in March or so was that Shout Factory, those responsible for the re-releasing of the Transformers G1 series and G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, and those special collector sets, apparently will be releasing Gem as well. But the question everybody has is, will it be all the seasons at once? Well, obviously, well, obviously, if we take a look at what they did with Transformers and G.I. Joe, it's going to be. And if they follow the same suit that they did with G.I. Joe and Transformers, it'll probably be in a collector set. Now, no one, now, we don't know the real details about that, but I do know that some fans out there, if not a majority of fans, would probably like something in that collector set along the lines of maybe a CD containing some of the songs. Because I can tell you this, I've seen from experience as a kid growing up that when little girls, young girls got those gem dolls, some of those gem dolls, I should say, some of those gem dolls came with a cassette of some of the songs. How do I know this? Because my older sister, Shannon, my older sister, Shannon, used to like gem. In fact, she named her daughter, Jerrica, after Jerrica Benton in the show. The only uh, difference is our Jerrica has one R in her name. Jerrica Benton has uh, two. But uh, anyway, but anyway, I'm pretty sure that if they had a audio CD of all the music fans have been wanting, then there's no doubt uh, that would be part of the collector set. But this is the cartoon flashback, so let's talk about Jim for a second. Gem, of course, was released as a cartoon in 1985 and ran to 19, 1988, from 85 to 88. Now, Gem was created by the same people that did, of course, Transformers Generation 1 and G.I. Joe, Real American Hero. They were also released, released by, of course, they were created, of course, by Hasbro. And, and they had... An association, comic book wise, and you know, television wise, with Marvel Comics, and of course, the animation was done in Japan. But the one thing about Gem, ladies and gentlemen, that really s made her stick out as a show was the fact that a lot of people, a lot of people, looked at Gem as as something different, something that. Never truly got, never really, you know, was done in any other show at the time except for maybe My Little Pony and Alvin and the Chipmunks. But you see, the thing about Jim and those that worked on Jim, being basically the same people that worked on Transformers and G.I. Joe, is it was, in a way, if you were a girl, yeah, it attracted you to it. Yeah, you were attracted to it because basically you had a female lead that you could watch. You can enjoy, you could, you know, look up to. And the songs, you know, it inspired you to want to be a singer growing up. Well, believe it or not, Jim didn't just, you know, and, and this sounds crazy, but you can look on YouTube, man. You can look on YouTube, you can Google it, there are some fan sites created by them. But there were young boys that were actually attracted to the gem show believe it or not they were because okay you know at a time when gem came out i was only like about i'd say about six years old when it came out so i really didn't understand i was more of a transformers gi joe guy but as i grew up and look back on it gem was more than just a girl's show it was a show for everybody and like i said it may have attracted young girls at the time and inspired them to want to be singers and all that. But the thing about Jim is the compelling storylines that it gave. The kind of compelling storylines that you would see almost on Transformers at times in G.I. In Joe. Very compelling. And, you know, it kept you interested in the episode. Kept you interested. And they did things normally that you wouldn't see in a so-called girls show so-called girls show that 
No one else did. I mean, in the second episode, in the, at the end of the first episode, going into the second, they they destroyed the home. They basically set the the Starlight Orphanage on fire. Now, today, if you were to do that with a girls' show, you'd basically have maybe thirty percent of the house burned, but most of it saved and it all, and all repaired, just like that. They didn't do that. They had them basically. For a time, for just a brief time before it became permanent, live in the mansion that was being put on the line in a contest, a Battle of the Bands contest. Now, that to me was compelling storylines because it not only drew in a female audience, in a way it drew in a male audience. Now some might say, well, Rio, uh, Jerrica Benton's uh, boyfriend in the show, Drew in the male audience, or Drew in the young boy audience. Yeah, Rio may have done it at times, but it was mostly the compelling storylines, and believe it or not, the songs themselves were actually pretty good. Brittany Phillips, I think that's her name, I could be wrong, was the singing voice of Jem. And she did a tremendous job. Tremendous job. And it was just like, you know, it was just so amazing. So amazing. You know, the way the songs were produced, the way they looked. It was just amazing. And they, and they, and they were very catchy songs, very danceable songs, if you will. But the one thing about Jim and the Holograms, which really, to me, sticks out to anybody, really sticks out to anyone is the fact that despite it being one of the most popular animated series of the 80s, probably one of the top five, it never got the treatment that the three other series produced by Hasbro got. You see, back in the 80s, if a toy show, if a, to if a show, if an animated cartoon show based on a toy line or a franchise succeeded on television, the next step, of course, was theatrical feature film. Well, My Little Pony got it after its two broadcast after its two primetime specials which led into the new series. Transformers got it in 1986. GI Joe got a feature film about the following year. And believe it or not, I read this online, you can google it, try to find it yourself. Jem was supposed to follow suit with a movie of, of her own. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned, though. You see, the Gem movie that was supposed to follow suit didn't occur. I mean, from what I understand, they were in the pre-production talk. They were, I think they had the script ready and everything. Everything, script rise and everything was ready to go, but everything fell through. And no, it wasn't due to finances or anything like that as far as I know. Maybe it was, maybe part of it was. But the real reason Jim, the movie, Jim, the theatrical fe feature film, animated feature film, did not get off the ground, ladies and gentlemen, goes back to Transformers. I know that's hard to believe. I mean, I like Transformers, the movie. Heck, my sisters have said that I've watched Transformers, the movie, the 1986 animated feature film, so many times that I know it line for line, scene for scene. And I probably do. But here's what happened. When Hasbro started doing this, they started out with My Little Pony. Now, My Little Pony, of course, was sort of like a Hasbro version of a Disney feature film. It had music. It was kind and gentle. It was rated G. It was for the whole family. And everybody liked it. And then Transformers came around the following year or so, or the same year, I should say, a few months later, the same year, Transformers came around a few months later, later in 86, and everything changed. I mean, if you listen to the fan commentary for the 20th anniversary of the Transformers, the movie DVD, the fans said that when this movie came out, everything changed. Everybody's outlook on an animated feature film changed. Because basically what was happening is you were having... What was happening is you, ha you were having mainstays 
primary characters, if you will, major or minor, from the Transformers series that ran from 84, the first two seasons, I should say, the, from the first two seasons, basically the first season in some sense, and a bit of the second season. But you were basically having characters that fans watched on television that seemingly looked indestructible. All of a sudden, they were getting blown to bits. I mean, some... I mean, so I mean, one of the things the commentator said about the first, you know, massacre scene, if you will, in Transformers the movie, was it was brutal, and that it was pushing the lines of PG. It was. It was pushing the lines of PG. Due to the fact that you had multiple deaths, you had Ironhide basically get his head blown off at the end, and then later on you have the iconic Optimus Prime get killed and die. Then you have Ultra Magnus get blown to bits and temporarily die. You know, it was a little too much for everybody. And then the swearing caught everybody off guard. So basically what happened was because of Transformers, the following movie, which was G.I. Joe, had to be rewrote. And Buzz Dixon, in his commentary about this, says that G.I. Joe the movie was originally supposed to have Duke, you know, die after he got stabbed in the heart with the poisonous snake. But, due to the fact that everybody, that every kid was upset at the fact that Optimus Prime died, and the parents weren't happy about the fact that the kids were crying over that, the script was rewrote for Duke to just be put into a coma. So you, now, you might say to yourself, well, what does this have to do with Jim? Well, due to all this, due to what happened with Transformers and the fact that along with the multiple deaths and the fact that it caught everybody off guard with its violence, Transformers the movie, even though it's a cult classic and people think, and there's a lot of people like myself that believe it was sort of a semi-success in theaters, basically overall bombed there. It was a critical failure. And that's what caused G.I. Joe to be a direct-to-television, direct-to-VHS film. And this, overall, is what caused the gem film to be shelved. That's right. The gem film was shelved. Even though, like I said, script was ready, they were ready to go into pre-production, do the voices and everything. Due to the fact of what happened with Transformers and G.I. Joe, they were, it was shelved. It was shelved. Now... A little trivia, though, according to Hasbro, according to some sources that I think worked with Hasbro for a while and Sunbow for a while, G.I. Joe was actually supposed to come out, out after My Little Pony, and then Transformers was supposed to follow G.I. Joe. But due to production reasons, that was reversed, and Transformers came out first. But anyway, overall... But anyway, overall, what I'm saying is that due to the fact of the critical financial failure in the box office of Transformers, even though, like I said, some of us may look at it as a semi-success, and due to the fact that because of that failure, G.I. Joe the movie had to be a direct-to-VHS and direct-to-television film, Gem's film was shelved. The script, I understand, was ready. The plot and everything was written up. Pre-production was getting ready. The voices were ready to be... Uh, voiced, the characters were ready to be voiced, I should say, but then that all came to an end because of what happened. And it was shelved. Now, according to Christy Marks, I could be wrong, I can't remember, I because I printed out the information somewhere, I don't know what I did with it, but according to what I read on here, Christy Marks basically says that Gem and the Holograms, the movie, the feature film, the animated theatrical feature film at that time, was in a way going to kind of follow suit to what G.I. Joe and Transformers had done. Basically, they were going to introduce new characters and they were going to take it step a few steps further. For example, there would be this group that would sort of be like the new villains, if you will, sort of like Jem's version of Cobra Law and Unicron and all that. But it would be this new group, this new band with almost this hypnotic sound to them that every time they played people would almost like fall into a spell or something like that. And according to what uh, was reported in this uh, thing that Christy Marks talked about, 
Jim was going to be one of them that would fall under the spell of this band. And that Rio, who would be the only one, I think, that would be unaffected, would find out through a hypnotic Jim that Jim and Jerrica were one and the same. Th that's what they said. That's what the script said. Or that's what the plot idea was. Basically, the story idea was to have Jim, even though she was hypnotically under a spell, if you will, reveal to Rio that she and Jerrica Benton are one and the same. Now, according to some other details as well, um, some things were going to change. I think Shauna or Aja was supposed to leave the group, I believe. One of them. I think it was going to be Aja. I'm not sure. And she was going to go with that guy. I can't think of his name right now. Basically go with Stormer's brother. Finally go be with Stormer's brother in Europe or something like that. And that Stormer, Stormer was actually going to be, um, uh, I think it was, uh, it was going to be Aja's replacement from what I read. Now, I, I, I'm not lying any about this. This is what I read. This is what I remember. Remember from reading this report, and pretty, I'm pretty sure a lot of you know what I'm talking about, but from what the plot was, and this actually I think was supposed to lead into one more season of Gem, maybe one that ran into 89 or was supposed to be for the 88th season, but Stormer was actually supposed to be in the movie, starting with the movie, be Aja's replacement as Aja would leave and be with her brother in Europe or somewhere. So Stormer would become basically a hologram and one of and then we'd have some kind of a new misfit come in. I don't know who it would be. But that was basically the layout, the plot from what I understand from that Christy Marx came out and told people about that the gem animated feature film, which was supposed to, like I say, follow suit of G.I. Joe Transformers and My Little Pony was going to have. Now, there is talk, believe it or not, there is talk uh, between Universal Studios and uh, Hasbro, since they have a partnership now, to produce and create a live-action gem movie. It's true. You can look this up on Google and Wikipedia. But it's true. There's actually a deal that's been set in stone well not set in stone but a deal that an idea that is yet to be set in stone but is being talked about for a possible revival of Jim now Jim and the holograms like I said at the beginning lasted from 85 to 88 so just like with a lot of Hasbro series at that time they had some new characters come in and be part of the groups be part of the groups be part of the be, be allies if you will and you know, as, you know, every year it just got better. And unfortunately, just like Transformers and G.I. Joe, they only lasted three years and three seasons. In the second season, we were introduced to a few new members. On the hologram side, we had uh, Raya, a Latino girl, I believe, who accidentally discovered that Jim and Jericho weren't the same, but did not spill the beans. Even though she was tempted at first by Eric Raymond, she did not steal the beans. And why did she not spill the beans? Because the newest member of the Misfits, that's right, newest member of the Misfits, Jetta, who is basically almost like a con artist, if you will, a musical con, musically talented, talented con artist, was wearing one of the flowers from her father's uh, garden shop. So anyway... Rhea becomes the newest hologram, and Jetta becomes the newest misfit. And it's through this second season when they're introduced that, again, they were introduced to uh, Stormer's brother, who falls in love with Aja, and Aja falls in love with him. And, again, this was supposed to lead into the fact that if the movie had been made, Aja would have went with him back to, I think, Europe or England, and Stormer was going to take Aja's place. Now, as the seasons progressed and we got into the third season, we had two new characters added in. We had Video, who became the video, who became the uh, video maker, music video maker for Gem and the Holograms. And we had her cousin, Clash, who was the video maker, music video maker for the Misfits. 
Now, I I can't I haven't seen the whole series for a long time, and what I'm doing right now is in the process, in the process, if you will, of downloading the entire season via torrents, via torrent that I have. So hopefully I'll have all the seasons on individual DVD plus R's, and then eventually down the line onto a DVD or so. But anyway, that's what's going. That's what was happening. That's what was happening. Um, you know, throughout the seasons, and it was during one of the episodes, I think during the third season or something like that, that the Misfits, believe it or not, they didn't turn totally good, but they basically changed their ways. They were still the Misfits, they were still mischief makers and all that, but they 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 basically valued each other, they valued each other than anything else. They looked out for each other more often. They took care of each other more than, you know, they would take care of themselves, of the individual selves, or, you know, they would look out for each other. Something like this happened. Basically, Pizzazz, the leader, found out that her friendship with Stormer, Jetta, and, and Roxy meant more to her than anything in, a, in an episode down the line in the third, th- third season, I believe. So, yeah. Basically, the Misfits turn good. Well, not totally good. They sort of become like tweeners. Let's put it that way. In betweeners, they sort of like become tweeners. So like, good, g- sort of. So they sort of became like the kind of people that did the right thing, but still had sort of a bad attitude at times. Let's just put it that way. They were like the Stone Cold Steve Austin, if you will, and the Randy Orton, if you will, of of uh, of the show later on. Now we did get introduced to another group, and this was actually the first group to be to have a male lead in it, and they were known as the Stingers. And the male lead's name was Riot, and Riot had a thing for Jerrica Benton's alter ego, Jim. And it was thanks to Jim that Riot, you know, became who he is, was able to, you know, reunite with his father and avoid the likes of Eric Raymond. And now, of course, let's talk about that guy, Eric Raymond. Every show needs a villain. Every show needs a villain that has a goal in mind. In Transformers, we have the villain of the Decepticons, Megatron, Galvatron. Their main goal is to conquer the universe and destroy the Autobots. G.I. Joe, we have Cobra Commander, Serpentor. Their main goal, conquer the world, destroy G.I. Joe. Eric Raymond. Eric Raymond's main goal, get back Starlight Music. Put Jim, a.k.a. Jerrica Benton, out of business. And find out who Jim is. That was the one other thing they added in. He want, One other thing they added in. And obviously they got this from inspiration of superhero comics. He want, His main goal, like I said, his main goals were to, one, get Starlight Music back. Put Jerrica Benton out of business. But also find out who Jim really was. Now throughout the series, Eric Raymond did get some hints and clues as to, you know, who Jim could be. And, you know... As to who she could, who she could be, and how, as far as I remember. In fact, in the uh, in the fu- in the second part of Battle of the Bands, in fact, in the fifth episode, Battle of the Bands, as he's leaving the office, he's taking the picture that the detective he hired took of the Synergy, uh, of Synergy's uh, computer. Uh, I can't even think of the name right now. Basically, of the of Synergy. Basically took the picture of Senechi with him. He basically put it in a yellow envelope and took it with him. Now, this again was all part of his goal to find out who Jim was. And he still had that goal going into the second season. Like I said with Rhea, he tried to blackmail Rhea. Did not happen. And as far as I know, he never really got to the truth. He never got close to the truth. But then again... But then again, this might have been where the movie would have, you know, done that for him. It would have been done for him by Jim or whoever, finding out that both were one and the same. I'm not really sure. But again, that was his main goal. Those were his main goals. Basically, put Jerrica Benton out of business, get Starlight Music back, make his music company bigger than, than Jerrica's, 
and thus also find out who Jim really was. Um, overall, Eric Raymond was basically a, a guy you could not trust. Let's just put it that way. And this is why I think the Misfits and uh, and the Stingers left him, or the Misfits left him. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody can correct me. I don't know. But but on to bigger, but on to other things now. Overall, Jim was basically a show that back then, if you were a young boy growing up, you probably wouldn't have liked watching it. But as you got older and started to become more mature and started to look back on things, you would realize it was actually a show for everybody. Yeah, it was originally targeted at little girls, but nowadays you look back on it and you think, wow, some of the things were targeted for girls, but overall the the story the stories were compelling, the music was good, the characters themselves were actually... You could, you know, the characters themselves, you could just enjoy them no matter what, you know. And overall, the presentation was great. It, it, it was just a great show. Again, like I said, back then, there may have been some elements that is, a, you know, a lot of things about the show as a little boy that you may have not liked. But as you got older and looked back on it with a, a nostalgic feel, you would say to yourself, you know what? This show uh, was pretty damn good. It was pretty damn good. And unfortunately, and it's sad though, that it didn't really get the treatment that Transformers, My Little Pony, and even though it was a direct-to-television and VHS release, G.I. Joe got, and that's the feature film treatment. However, believe it or not, there is a gem movie. It's true. I'm not lying. I was looking on Amazon the other day, and apparently there is a gem the movie. But it's actually just a DVD and I believe a VHS of the first five episodes paired together as one movie. And we all know that, and basically that's, ba and, and overall that's how things, how movies sometimes have to get made, right? Overall that's how movies get made. Made for certain series that were supposed to get movies, but never did. And basically that's Hasbro's, I guess, way of saying, okay, Jim never got a movie, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to give her a movie. We're going to give her a movie in the form of her first five episodes paired together. <laughs> That's what they did, folks. So, yeah, there is a gem, the movie, but it's basically the beginning, disaster, uh, Kimber's Rebellion, Friends Forever, and Battle of the Bands, I think, all paired in as one. So, as one movie. So, yeah, that, that's what it is. That's what they did. I, I'm not lying, folks. So, but, um, yeah, overall, Jim was, like I said, was a good, when, when you look back at it now, in a nostalgic way, it was a good show. It's probably one of the better shows that came out at that time. And I'm glad that a lot of people are getting the chance to relive it, rewatch it again on television. I'm glad the new generation of kids are getting a chance to watch it. And, you know, what's kind of ironic is I said that Gem's going to be broadcast um, three times a, three times a day now, 11 a.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Pacific, and 10 p.m. Pacific. What's funny about the 10 p.m. is that she comes on after G.I. Joe and Transformers, just like back in the day. <laughs> that, that's what got put a smile on my face because I remember as a kid watching on KTVU Channel 2, I remember watching Transformers, G.I. Joe, and then Jim would come on and my sisters would watch that. Or if they had it in a reverse order, it'd be like Ponies, Jim, Transformers, G.I. Joe, or G.I. Joe, Transformers, Ponies. You get the idea. But, you know, just to see that lineup right there from 9 to 10.30 at night, it definitely takes me back because that is how I remember it. And that's how I'm always going to remember it. So I'm thankful that... Hasbro, the hub channel, has brought these shows back and have brought put them in a sort of an hour and a half lineup that is very nostalgic to me because that's how I used to watch them. And I know I'm not the only one. So that's going to do it for this edition of the Cartoon Flashback as we look back at Jim 
and the holograms. Thank you all for watching and listening, and I will talk to you later.